Welcome back to where we've been coding rock, paper, scissors. This is going to be part two of the video, perhaps the final part. Um, let's pick up kind of where we left off. I want to show you what the final result should look like. It says, let's play rock, paper, scissors, and then ask how many rounds. Please enter a positive odd number. So we can play multiple games of rock, paper, scissors, multiple rounds. Um, in the previous video, what we were striving towards was to just do one round. Uh, but again, we see the end result is that we can play multiple rounds, which is best two out of three. And then we are presented with a menu. Now this does validate user input. So if I try to choose six, we would see something like choice invalid. I think R says slightly something different, but the idea is still the same. We have to choose between one, two, and three. I'm gonna go paper. Ooh, paper was good. Computer chose rock and we got a win under our belt. So I'm gonna try paper again. It's a tie. Mm, paper let me down. Overall, paper the clear choice. We chose paper in the last round. The computer chose rock. We win with a score of two to one overall. Yay! All right, so that is kind of our end results. And where we kind of left off was trying to figure out who won the individual round, right? We are welcomed with let's play rock, paper, scissors. We then are given the choice menu, one, two, or three. We validated our choice. So we're guaranteed to have a one, two, or three option by the time we get down here. Super important, okay? Um, we have this kind of text message that's indicating you know, what um, our ultimate choice was. We display it back to the user just to kind of make sure. This is more so for like error testing, that sort of thing than anything else. But notice I'm going with the string approach. We could do three different system.out.print lines. Um, I like doing this string approach when I can because it makes maintaining, editing the program a lot easier. If I make a change here to this initial string, it effectively ch changes it for all three, right? Um, so that makes it a little bit easier to maintain. Whereas if I use three different SOPs where the entire message is shoved in that SOP, I gotta edit all three SOPs to simulate that exact same change. But once we get to this point, the user has selected, their, has made their choice, rock, paper, or scissors by using a integer number. The computer is going to also choose within that same range, one to three, but they're doing it randomly. We'll see what the computer chose via this text choice, and we print that off. So we're now actually ready to determine who is the winner of the round. And I tend to let students kind of do this on their own, and uh, then we kind of reconvene and see what the, uh, what the solutions are. What I'd like you to recognize right away is it, uh, you can come up with like some crazy if, else if, else if, else if, else if types of logic trees, and that's a bit much. What I want you to recognize is from an abstract manner, right? Take a step back. There are three possible outcomes. Either the user won, the computer won, or there was a tie. That's it. By that logic, our logic tree should only have three branches, right? So it should look something like if, else if, else. There are three possible outcomes. This is what I mean by our logic tree should have three branches. Okay. By far the easiest one to actually kind of test for and recognize is if there's a tie. If there is a tie, that means that these numbers, right, the choice and comp choice are ultimately the same, right? There's no reason really to compare text choice to text choice. That's really the same variable at, at this point. What I'm comparing are these two numbers. If choice, that's the user's choice, is equal to comp choice, we chose the same thing. That's just simply a tie. So I'm gonna print off a, uh, a message kind of indicating that. I can, again, go with um, some type of string input here. In this particular case, the, the choices are so different or the messages are so different um, that that's not exactly worth it. So if choice is equal to comp choice, we're going to indicate that there is a tie. Why don't I see if I can actually get a tie real fast? I'm going to highlight this bit of code, hit control forward slash to comment out all of those lines, and I'm going to test for a tie. 
This is a little RNG dependent, but one out of three is not bad. Rip. Oh, it's a lot harder when we're not playing multiple rounds. Why don't you just believe me and that it works? Okay. What that means is we're actually ready to set up these other branches. We're looking at the user one, the computer one, right? Maybe I even put a comment here. This means user one, computer one. Okay, so what that means is this condition needs to handle basically all the scenarios where the computer one. So let's think about that for a moment. What we're talking about in terms of possible ways that the user can win. Let's see, if the user chose rock, which is a one, and the computer chose paper, which is a three, that's a situation where the user wins. If the user chooses paper, which is a two, and the user chose rock, which is a one, that's a situation where the user wins. If the user chose scissors, which is a three, and the computer chose paper, which is a two, that's where the user wins. So these are the three scenarios that ultimately get back to this one scenario of the user winning. So let's look for some commonality to kind of help reduce as much code as possible. And right away, I can kind of see a difference in numbers, right? These two scenarios, there's actually a mathematical difference. When the user's choice minus the comp choice is exactly one. That handles these two right here, right? Choice would be two. We subtract out comp choice, which is a one. That's a difference of one. If choice is a three and comp choice is a two, and we subtract that out, that's also a difference of one. So that handles both of these. We can set up something similar, right? You could actually just literally check for the values one and three if you wanted to, or we could actually follow this path. If we do choice minus comp choice, and we end up getting a negative two, right? This one minus this three results in a negative two, but that's actually this scenario where the uh, user chose rock and the computer chose scissors, then these are all three scenarios. I have bundled them together in this one logic branch because they all represent when the user wins. I'm going to print off something of that sort. You win. So what's nice about this logic branch is we handled the easiest thing first. It's not, I guess these are all equally likely. We, we handled the easiest thing first. We then handled the user next. And because I'm just relying on this else, if all else fails, that means the computer one. So let's actually take a look at that. Okay, I'm gonna run my program. And this time I should get some type of output message no matter what, because we were handling every situation. I'm going to choose rock. We chose rock, which was a one. The computer chose scissors, which was a three. That actually triggered on this choice, right? We would go down this logic branch. We would ask is choice, which is gonna be a one, equal to comp choice, which is a three? No. We would ask is choice, which is a one, minus comp choice, which is a three. Is that equal to a negative two or a one? Well, this negative two would not equal one, so that would be false. We would check the other side and ask does one minus three equal a negative two? Yeah, that must be this scenario, in which case we win. I'd like to test and basically try to get all three branches to trigger, right? We got this branch to trigger, so that was fine. There's a computer one. All I really need is that tie, that sneaky little tie again. If we don't get there, we don't get there, but. The easiest one to actually code for is, ah, there we go. Okay, so that's effectively it, right? What we coded is one round of rock, paper, scissors. You agree? 
from basically line 11 all the way down to line 64 is one round. It's, I'm highlighting this for a particular reason, right? 64 all the way up to 11. This is one round. I'm going to highlight these lines and I'm going to hit tab because in order to do this multiple times, all I got to do, we're all in agreement, right? What I have highlighted is one round. All I have to do is put this in a loop, all of this in a loop, in order to play multiple rounds. So I have it highlighted, I've tabbed it over. I'm gonna come in here and I'm going to put in a loop. And I'm gonna go ahead and tell you that a while loop kind of makes the most sense. You could use a for loop. While loops, for loops, they're ultimately interchangeable. But I'm going to plug in my while loop syntax. And I have that brace there. In this brace here, the ending brace, and um, when you get start getting code that's, sorry, IntelliJ is doing some automatic stuff. When you start getting code that is this deep, like so many lines of code, right? We're already at like 70 lines, and there's going to be more. We may break 100. Doing stuff like this is a is a good way to kind of keep track of stuff, right? This is the end of the while loop. This is the end of the main method, and this is the end of our class. Okay, so I'm gonna throw those comments in there to kind of help us not get so lost. But what I have inside of this loop represents one round. So now we wanna be able to play multiple rounds, right? Well, in order to do that, our final result is going to ask the user how many rounds they wanna play. So as soon as we welcome them to the game, we can maybe create our scanner. Notice that my scanner is not inside of the loop. For one thing, I need it from the beginning because I'm about to ask for a number of rounds. But for another, I don't want to create it and destroy it over and over and over again inside the loop. Right? I can just reuse it. I can create it one time and just use it multiple times inside of this loop. But we have our scanner. Let's ask the user um, how many rounds. and then prompt them further by saying, using a print, please enter a positive odd number. Okay, I'm using a print here so that their input shows up next to this colon, right? I've talked about print versus print line, but we do want a positive odd number, something like best out of one, that's a possibility, best out of three best out of five, best out of seven, that sort of thing. So I'm getting input from them. Let's actually get that input. I'm gonna save it into a variable called rounds. And now I want to validate, right? We're asking for a positive odd number, but because we're accepting an integer, they could give me any number. I don't want that. I'm gonna use a while loop to validate it. If this while loop is true, that means it is invalid. Right? It means the rounds that they gave me was invalid. If this is true, that means the rounds they gave me was invalid. I think this condition is uh, pretty easy for a lot of students. I need to make sure right, that rounds is invalid if it's not positive. Right? How do I know? Well, rounds would be less than or equal to zero, right? If rounds is less than or equal to zero, that means that it's zero or a negative number. Or another way that rounds could be invalid is if it's just simply an even number. How do I know? Well, if I divide it by two and there is no remainder. Okay, so these are the scenarios in which rounds would be invalid. If it's negative or zero or an even number. If that happens, let's tell them. Let's tell them that it's invalid. We would say something like invalid input and show them the number that they entered. We would then ask for a, um, a positive odd number again. We would then want to capture it. 
Okay, we got a red error message here. I talked about this one in the previous video. I don't want to redeclare rounds, right? When I provide a data type, it's as if I'm trying to make the variable all over again. That's not what I want to do. What I want to do is assign it a new value. I'm going to leave off the data type so that we just simply save in a new value. Um, why don't we comment out this while loop header for now? Note that I can just have braces wrapped around a section of code and that's actually syntactically perfectly fine. What I want to do is test that I'm validating rounds correctly. So I'm going to tell it to run. Enter a positive odd number. Um, let's go with three. Okay, everything seems to go through just fine. And despite the number of rounds, I'm not really doing anything with rounds. It only played one, but we are checking to make sure our validation works. So let's try something that's invalid, like zero. Invalid input zero, please enter a positive odd number. How about negative two? Positive odd number, how about just two? Positive odd number. So we are validating correctly. What that means is by the time I reach this loop on line 21, currently on line 21, we are guaranteed to have a valid number of rounds. It will be a positive odd number. It's the only way to make it to this point. Okay, so I have my number of rounds that I want to play. We're going to play multiple rounds thanks to this loop. What I need to do is kind of figure out the condition here. And really what happens in the uh, when you play a best of series is the series is over once one person gets a majority of wins. Okay, so think about some things that we're going to need in order to track this. I would It'd be nice to know what majority of the wins actually is based on our number of rounds. But we need to also track those wins. Okay, so I actually think uh, tracking wins is probably a little bit more straightforward. So let's do that. I'm going to plug in two counter variables. I'm going to create wins, which starts at zero, and I'm going to create comp wins. I've got two counter variables for each player. There's multiple ways that you can ultimately do this. You could maybe do like a plus minus system. I think this is probably the easiest and most straightforward. So we have these counter variables, right? This tracks the wins for the users. I'm not even going to put a comment because I think it's so uh, self-explanatory and we have comp wins for the computer but the real question is where do these things actually get incremented right they're designed to track wins and computer wins and how do we know when an actual round has been won well that's this logic tree down here I put braces on these things kind of for a reason right this logic branch represents when the user won Right? We print out a message indicating as such. So whenever this is true, not only am I going to display a message to the user, I need to actually increment the wins counter variable. Just a simple wins plus plus. Does it matter if it comes before or after the SOP, system.out? If I manage to hit this logic branch, that means the computer one, we're going to display a message and we're going to increase comp wins by one. Notice that in the event of a tie, we print out the message, but these values don't change. Okay, that's super important. Effectively, a tie just doesn't count for anything. It doesn't count towards the overall uh, wins or rounds played, really. So I have these counter variables tracking wins and computer wins. I want to create a loop based on this. I want to keep looping as long as neither player has, a has amassed a majority. I'm going to create this majority variable here because it's going to clean up our condition here in just a moment. I want to know what a majority is, right, based on rounds. I'm telling you it's based on rounds. So let's go ahead and plug in that variable, but let's actually think. I'm going to plug in some values. Let's just say that the user enters five. Now you should know that a majority of wins is three. Okay, so how do I get that? Well, one thought is let's divide by two. That's going to be 2.5, right? So we add one to that and that's like 3.5. 
But take a look. Rounds is an integer. 2 is an integer. What's actually going to happen here is I'm going to take my rounds, which again I'm going to use 5 as the example. I'm going to take my rounds, divide it by 2. What I have here is division between two integers, so it's actually going to truncate. This is not going to be 2.5. This is going to be 2, at which point I add 1, which is going to, of course, give me my 3. So here is an instance where I actually like truncation. This is actually kind of a good thing. I'm relying on it to get the exact number. So this is the formula I'm going to use for my majority, and I'm saving it into a variable to, make, uh, to increase readability, make this condition a little bit cleaner. So while we're going to keep playing the game as long as a player does not have a majority. So while wins, that's the human wins, is less than a majority, and the computer wins is less than a the majority, then we'll keep playing the game. Okay, let's test this out. This should effectively be it, right? We are getting our rounds. We have our counter variables to track the number of wins. We have our whole round inside of a while loop that should keep looping as long as wins is less than the majority and comp wins is less than the majority. So both players have not amassed a majority. And we're going to be incrementing those win counter variables. I'm gonna try this out. There's, of course, some little bit more changes that we're gonna make, but that's okay. How many rounds? Let's do best two out of three. I'm going to go with uh, rock. It's a tie. So notice that we've played one round. Another tie. We've played two rounds. I, even though I've played two rounds, those basically shouldn't count, right? Because they were ultimately ties. Okay, I won. So that should count as a round. So notice that I entered three and we are still technically playing. We're effectively on the fourth round. What I'm really doing is playing best two out of three. Okay. And ultimately the computer won. So based on this logic, right? Notice that our program finally finished. Based on all of this, uh, we ultimately played five total rounds, even though we asked for three. That's because it took five rounds for one player to amass to a majority. Okay, um, let's try to maybe get it to kind of terminate early, right? I want, just like that, <laughs> um, I wanted one player to basically get two wins real fast. So even though I asked for three total rounds, I won two games real fast. So that means that this majority variable, along with this condition, is working like we want. Um, minor updates just to kind of help things out. I like having a score update at the end of each round. Okay, right, so if I bring back our final product, what am I talking about? Well, so here we did some invalid inputs. We chose paper, we won, we saw that message, and then I see this one to zero score marker. That's what I want, okay? So we gotta think about this. Oh. <laughs> this is the answer. So we got to think about this. I said at the end of each round. Well, a round is basically encased inside of this while loop, right? Right here is where we determine the winner. After these if statements, I'm still inside of the while loop. We just determined the winner. I'm ready to show an updated score. I'm going to do a system out.print line. What we're going to display we're going to print is the user's number of wins plus a little hyphen here to kind of separate them the computer's number of wins okay let's try that one that small change notice it's at the very end of the while loop but still part of the while loop let's play three rounds computer one and we see that their score they earned a one we won so we see a one-to-one. -one. And then lastly, the computer one. I'd like to kind of see a tie. Uh, what's one really nice thing about having the score 
indicator is that in the event of a tie, you see that there is no change, right? Because when we have a tie, all we do is print off the message, but we don't affect wins and we don't affect comp wins. Okay, we get it with the demonstration. Um, last thing I wanna do is this final output message. Right? This is who won overall. Right? This is who managed, like, I'm, I'm not gloating here. I keep coming back to this one, but we had a two to one score line. And so the user won overall. So where would I put that? Here's the end of my while loop. If I'm outside of the while loop, but still inside the main method, we've reached the end of the game. So I want one final message, right? Based on to determine, to say who won overall. I'm gonna plug in an if statement. How do I know? Well, if at this point, because we, we are guaranteed to have an odd number of rounds, we're guaranteed to be done playing all of the rounds. At this point, one person is going to have a higher score than the other, period. They won't be tied, right? So there's only two possible outcomes, right? Either the user won or the computer won. If wins is greater than comp wins, then that means the user won. I'm gonna print something off to that effect. And I like my little happy face here. Otherwise, if I hit this else, that means the computer won overall. I don't even remember. I think I like what just a sad face. Oh, I just had a you lose. You lose. And that's basically it. I'm going to run it one more time to test that final output message. And again, I like to test it for both test cases. But I'm going to play best two out of three. I'm going rock. I made really good choices just now. Um, let's play like, uh, I would like to show you that we could just play best out of one. That's a possibility, right? Rip. But we got the other scenario that I wanted to test for and we have reached the end of our program. So close to that 100 line mark. Quick review. We welcome the user, we ask for how many rounds, we validate it. We have these variables to track the number of wins. This little majority variable is just to clean up this condition. Right? If I didn't have it, then this little bit of code would be here and here. But as long as the player has not gotten a majority of wins and the computer player has not gotten a majority of wins, then the game should still keep going. We prompt the user with our menu. We get their choice. We validate their choice to make sure they're giving me a one, two, or three. I kind of talked about in the last video how this is not that important. It turns out this actually is super important to make sure they're giving us exactly one, two, or three because when we make our comparisons down here to see who the winner is, I can't have extraneous values like fours and negative numbers. Okay, um, so here we're just showing what the user got back to them. We then random the choice for the computer, again in that exact same range. We learned random in the last video, or one of the last videos. Three is the number of choices. In this number range, there are three possible choices. However, that starts at zero, so your initial values would be zero, one, and two. I'm going to shift that number range with this plus one, and that's how we get there with that. We are reusing our text choice variable from above because I don't need it anymore. There's no reason to make a new string when I could just use this one instead. I basically reset it to computer chose. We are then going to change the text here based on what the computer actually chose. And then we display what the computer chose here. Here we're determining a winner. Of note, you could get rid of these braces because there's actually only one statement inside of this if statement. But this is the easiest one to look for. If the two choices are the same, it must be a tie. Otherwise, we talked about these scenarios where the user won or the computer won. There's only three possible outcomes. 
afterwards we display our um, score and that is inside of the while loop. I'd like you to remember that what I did was just code one round and then just shove that into a loop in order to repeat it multiple times. And then we have our final message outside the loop but inside the main method of who won or lost overall. This has been it for Rock, Paper, Scissors. I'll see you in the next one.